Redemption, let's give God a shout of praise. Amen. Hey, you guys should be seated. I want to talk to you guys for just a moment as we close out our study through the book of Psalms. I want to talk to you about how you can pray for your church. I want to tell you the, the story that has really inspired what is happening here tonight, this, this movement that is the, the prayer meeting here at Redemption. I read a quote from Charles Spurgeon where he says this. He says that the prayer meeting is a graceometer. He says, as the prayer meeting goes, so goes the church. Charles Spurgeon is known as the, the Prince of Preachers back in the 1800s. He pastored the, the, Metro Tab, the, the, the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. And he was a young man as he planted that church. And the church grew and he became very famous. People would travel for miles around just to be able to come and listen to Charles Spurgeon preach. His letters were famous. He wrote for the paper and his sermons would be printed all across the London Times. And people would read them every single week because that's just how prolific of a pastor he was in that region. There was a story where one day there was a, a couple of young men who they were in town visiting and they wanted to go see um, Charles Spurgeon preach. They wanted to see the, metro, the, the, the tabernacle. And so they go in and they, they start walking around and, and they're, meet, they're, they're greeted by an elderly man at the door who asks to give him a tour of the church. And so they agree, and so they go in, and they take a look at the sanctuary, and they take a look at the organ, and they take a look at the pulpit, and then the guy says, hey, do you want to come, and do you want to look at our boiler room? And they're like, no, we have no interest in looking at the boiler room. He said, hey, I'm just telling you, like, it's a really interesting room. You need to come see the boiler room. And they say, we don't want to see it, so he takes them on a tour of the grounds, takes them outside. He takes them to every little piece, and at the end of the tour, he says, I really think you need to come and see the boiler room because, because that's what makes our church so special. And they're like, what's wrong with this old man? Why does he want to take us down into the boiler room of an old church? And he's insistent. So he says, you need to come and see this boiler room. And so they agree. And it's before the sermon. And he takes them downstairs into a back room. And as they go down into the boiler room, he opens up the door. And instead of finding a boiler room, he finds a room filled with a prayer meeting of people who are down on their knees, praying for their city and interceding for the church. And then he looks at the young men and he says, this is the power of our church. The power of our church is when people pray. And that man who was leading him around, his name was Charles Spurgeon. And they didn't recognize it because they didn't have social media, but they were actually talking to the Prince of Preachers. They didn't know what his face looked like. But that's really important for us to notice is this, is that as the prayer meeting goes, so goes the church. That the prayer meeting is, the, is the, the thermometer that really reads the temperature and the health and the vitality and the, the spiritual fervor that a church has. That's why the prayer meeting is so incredibly important. And, and here's the reason why. It's because a church is only limited by the size of its prayers. If a church wants to be able to see God move, then it must be a church that is willing to pray. If there's a church that wants to see miracles happen, then it's a church that must pray. If there's a church that is to see healings take place, then that church must pray. If there's a church that is going to reach their prodigal sons and daughters in Southeast Texas, it is going to be a praying church. If there is going to be a church that sees breakthrough, then it's going to be a praying church. If there is going to be a church that sees a gospel center movement in the heart of the city and for the region, it is going to be a praying church church. If there is a church that is going to see every man, woman, and child come experience life change through Jesus, it is only through a praying church. If there is a church that's going to have healthy marriages, that is going to be a praying church. If there is a church that is going to have men and women who love one another the way that God loves them, it's going to be a praying church. If there's going to be a church where there's children who are raised up and trained up in the ways of the Lord so that in their older days they do not depart from it, it will be a praying church. If there's going to be a church that's going to make a difference in the city, it will be a praying church because the church church is only limited by the size of its prayers. That's why the prayer meeting is so important. I've told you the story behind the prayer meeting here at Redemption is that for the first three years of our church, we were a good church, but we were not necessarily a growing church. 
And I had been all the conferences. I read all the books and all the blogs. I was even coaching for church planting networks. But yet at the same time, our church was stagnant. Our church was not growing. We were not seeing salvations and testimonies or healings taking place. And I remember one day I was just so frustrated. And I would say, God, I have done all of the stuff. I've done all of the things. And why is our church still stuck? And that's when the Lord spoke to me. He said, Byron, you are not a praying church. You've tried everything in your own power. How about you step out of the way and let me do what I do? And you teach your people to pray. Because there's some things that you can only do in your strength, but when you reach that point of weakness, that's when God begins to prove himself strong. And it's in that prayer moment that you humble yourself and you go before the Father and you say, God, I need you to show up. I need you to move. That's when God loves to show off his power because a church is limited by the size of its prayers. And the moment that we began praying as a church and we made First Wednesdays a priority for us as a church, as we say, if you can only make it to one service, make it first. Wednesday because that's how important it is. And I can draw you a graph about the, the growth, not only in our attendance numbers, but in our finances, in our small group numbers, in our salvations, in the testimonies, in the healings. I mean, it is just like a rocket ship growth. The moment we began praying as a church, the moment we started praying as a church, that's when everything began to change in our church. If you're new to redemption, this might be your first, or this might be one of the few prayer meetings that you've made. You, you wonder, what is it that makes redemption unique or special? What is the secret sauce behind? I can guarantee you, it's not me. It's not Trevor. It's not our social media. It's not our parking team, although they're amazing. But here's what it is. It is that we are a church that prays. Yeah. We're a church that prays, and we prioritize prayer and what we do. Thank you for being here at the prayer meeting because it shows me that you love your church, you're prioritizing prayer for your church, and whenever God's people pray, it has a cumulating compound effect on what God is able to do in the midst of his people whenever his people pray. And so I want to talk to you tonight about how we can pray for our church. And it's the final sermon out of our study through the book of Psalms, and we're going to be in Psalm 122. And it's Actually, what it's known, it's a psalm of ascent. So it's, it's David and all of his companions, and they're getting ready to go up to uh, the temple, and they're getting ready to go worship and to perform their sacrifices, that they're going up to Jerusalem where they're going to, to worship. It is the journey. It is their ascent up the hill. And what you'll notice is this, is that David is praying for what is about to happen as they enter into the house of the Lord. He is praising God. He is encouraging his people. He is praying over the house of the Lord. And here's what he says. He says this, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. How many of you are excited to come to church? How many of you are excited about what God is doing? How many of you on Saturday, you just get excited about Sunday? I need you to know something. Is that a great Sunday starts on Saturday? That you're preparing your heart. You're praying for your church. You're not coming in empty-handed. You're coming in full so that way you can pour out so that God can fill you back up, right? Because a great church service on Sunday actually starts by you preparing your heart on Saturday. He says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together to which tribes go up and the tribes of the Lord as was decreed of Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones against the house of David. Therefore pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and my companions, here's what he's doing. He is talking to the people amongst them. He's speaking to the congregation. They're about to go to the house of Lord, he speaks to them, and here's what he says. He says, I will say, peace be within you for the sake of the house of the Lord our God. I will seek your good. What's fascinating to me is this, is that this was written thousands of years ago, and here's what David says whenever he's talking about the house of the Lord, when he's talking about going to a place of worship, when he's talking about the congregation. Here, here's what he says. Well, first, he says, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. And then he closes it by saying, I will seek your good. Now, true or false, do we live in a day and age to where the church has a, a great reputation amongst other people? No, it seems like today it's more easy to criticize the church, to blame the church, to point fingers at the church, to, to complain about the church. But God doesn't want us to complain about our church. 
God doesn't want us to curse, criticize our church. Here, here's what God wants us to do. God wants us to pray for our church. You know, I've never met a negative person who's had a positive impact on anybody. Have you? It seems to me like the more negative a person is, the more negative the effect they have on that thing. But instead, here's what God wants. God wants us to be glad, to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to seek peace, to seek welfare, to seek good, to seek the positiveness, to seek the the flourishing of the house of the Lord. And so here's what I've determined in my heart, and I would just let this settle inside of your heart. Instead of complaining about the church, take time to pray for your church. Because there is power in your prayers. Like you have the the power to be able to change things. And if it doesn't change the situation around you, it can change the situation inside of you. And it can give you a different perspective about what's happening. Listen, the shortest distance between two things is prayer. And so as you begin to pray for your church, you'll notice that God is going to begin to change your heart for that very thing. And so instead of complaining about the church, we're going to take time and we're going to begin to pray about the church. We're not going to jump in on all of the, you know, the violence viral memes and all of the, you know, the, the, the virtue signaling that is happening outside in society where people are criticizing the church or bashing the church or tearing down other leaders or other pastors or other denominations. No, here's what the church really needs. The church needs to have a corporate gathering of prayer where we lift up the body of Christ, where we lift up the name of God, where we begin to declare that the church would actually be who God has called it to be. And I, for one, will not be one found complaining about the church, but rather I will spend my time praying for the church because the church, the the church is plan A. There is no plan B. Jesus loves the church. Jesus left the church to us. We are the church. And so instead of complaining about the church, what we do is we gather together in settings like this, just like David does. And he just begins to pray for his church. So the question is, well, how can we pray for our church? In the next 13 minutes and 33 seconds, I want to give you 10 ways, and then we're going to dive in, and we're just going to we're going to spend some time, and we're going to we're going to pray for our church tonight. Is that good with you? So I'm going to give you 10 ways that you can pray for your church. The first way is this: that you pray for the unity of the church. In John 17:11, here's what Jesus says: "I am no longer in this world, but they are in the world." Jesus ascends to heaven, and then he dispatches the church. That's you and me. We are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name for which you have given to me, that they may be one, even as we are one. What I find fascinating is at the end of Jesus' life, when he's praying for the church, Jesus prays for the church, and here's what he says. He is His prayer request to God, the one thing he asks God is not that the church would grow. He doesn't ask the church to be successful. He doesn't ask that they would have miracles. He doesn't ask they would have healing. He doesn't ask that they would have riches or power or fame. You know what the one prayer request that Jesus made before the Father was? That they would be unified. Because when a church is unified, everything else is possible. When a church is unified, growth happens naturally. Miracles begin to take place. When the church is unified, there is a sweetness of the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. And God is able to move and flow and work because there is unity that is happening within that church. Listen, God works through unity, but Satan works through division. See, see, Jesus knew that if there would be division, then Satan would be able to have his way amongst those people. But rather, he prays that God would protect them and he would bring them into his supernatural unity. People ask, they say, Byron, how long can redemption keep up whatever it's doing? And here's what my answer would be. As long as we are unified in our prayers, then we could accomplish anything. As long as there is a supernatural unity in the house behind the, behind the work that God has called us to be, then we will be unstoppable because there is power whenever we come together in unity. The second thing is this. We pray that Jesus will be glorified. 1 Thessalonians 2.11 says, To this end, we always pray for you. I want you to notice, what was Jesus doing? He was praying for the church. What is Paul doing? He is praying for the church. Why? Because we need to be in prayer for our church. He says, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by whose power? His power, not our strength, not our power, 
power, but by his power, so that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. Pray a prayer like this. Jesus, be glorified in our church. We don't want to do anything for our credit or for our glory or for our fame or for our prestige or for our clout. No, we want everything to be done for your glory. Jesus would say it like this, that as you lift me up, I will draw all men unto myself. John the Baptist says, I must decrease so that he might increase. What is the goal of the church? To glorify and to magnify and to praise and to give honor to Jesus Christ above everything else. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's, it's not about, you know, all of these accolades. No, that's not the point. The point is that in everything that we do, that Jesus would get the credit, Jesus would get the glory, Jesus would get the honor, and that Jesus would be praised above all. Like my goal when people walk out on a Sunday morning is not to say, wow, Byron is so special or wow, redemption is so great. No, my goal that when people leave at the prayer meeting or on a Sunday morning, they would say, wow, God is so good. Jesus is so amazing. The Holy Spirit is in that place. My prayer is that Jesus be glorified above all else in everything that we do. God, remove the pride and be glorified in our church. Number three, pray that the Holy Spirit would fill the church. Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, what is the church doing? They're praying. I'm trying to get this in your heart that we are to be a praying church. And if we want to be a praying church, we need to be a people who prays for our church. It is evident everywhere in all of the scriptures that a church is to pray. He says, they prayed in the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. Right now, our society needs a bold church. And in order for a church to be bold, it also must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is what enables that confidence and that security and that boldness that happens. And if we're going to be a church that continues to reach the lost, continues to preach the gospel, and to advance the kingdom, it is going to only come when the church is filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, God has strategically designed the church to fail without the power of the Holy Spirit. If there is no spirit, there is no illuminating of the preaching of the word of God. If there is no spirit, this isn't a worship team. This is just a bad karaoke band. Like, if there is no spirit, there's no purpose of us worshiping here. If there is no spirit, there is no testimonies of breakthrough that's going to happen in people's lives. But where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is liberty, there is power that breaks down strongholds. And so if we are going to pray for our church, here's what the church should be praying for. That we'd be filled with the Holy Spirit. That the spirit of God would begin to fall upon us so that way we can continue to preach the word of God with boldness. We pray for a church that their members would begin to love one another. John 13, 35 says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. How? By your Facebook posts. It's not what he says. And all these will know because you shared a meme on Instagram. And all these will know you are my disciples because you wore a WWJD bracelet. No. And, and, and they will know that you're my disciples because of your doctrine, because you hated people who disagreed with you. And they will know you are my disciples because of your social media posts. And they will know that you are my disciples because of your opinion or because you voted for. No, that's not what he says. What does he say? And the whole world will know that you are my disciples. Why? Because of your love for one another. People may disagree with us. They may deny us. They may refute us, they may argue with us, they may cancel us, but they will not deny our love. They will not deny the way that we love one another, the way that we serve one another, the way we bless one another, the way we care for one another, the way we make time for one another, the way that we prioritize other people. They may not agree with our doctrine, but they cannot disagree with our love. The world will know that we are his church. Why? Because of our love for one another. Pray that people in your church would love one another with the love that Jesus has, that we would not be self-consumed, that we would not be self-centered, that we will not be navel gazers or narcissists, but pray that your church would be overflowing with love for who? for God and for people, for one another, that we would take special care for those who are in the household of God. Do you know the prayer needs of the person who's sitting next to you right now? Do you know what the person next to you is experiencing or walking through or going through? Do you know if somebody in your small group is hungry? Do you know if somebody on your serve team is struggling? Do you know how the marriages are going in your, in your serve team? Do, do you love and generally care for what is happening in the body of Christ right now? Pray that there would be love amongst the people of God. Number five, pray that the church would be radically generous. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, the point is this. I love that Paul says this. He's like, the point is this. Get this through your thick. No, I'm just kidding. 
Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly, um, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Pray that the church will be radically generous. You know, there's a lot of needs in our community. There's a lot of needs right here in our church. There's a lot of needs right there in the back where the kids are right now that it takes finances to be able to support the mission that is happening. And so be praying that there would be a church that is radically generous, that we don't think how much should we give, but rather we, we think how much could we keep, right? That's not what we want to do. We don't, we don't think how much of God's money am I going to hold on to? We want to have a radically generous church where there's a need, we meet that need, and that we're able to sow generously back into the church and back into people's lives. There's multiple ways that a church could be generous. One way that our church is generous is we give back to our community. 10% of what comes in goes back out to local and foreign missions. And so as a church, we're generous. But then you're also to be generous towards the church. But other than that, there's people in our church who model this not by giving actually to the church while they do give their tithe. I know people in our church who there would be somebody in the parking lot with a, with a flat tire. And they went out and they bought four brand new tires for that single mother. That's what generosity looks like. It's not just giving to an organization, but it's giving unto the Lord. Giving unto the Lord, not with a begrudging heart, but rather with a cheerful heart because for God loves a cheerful giver. And some of you are like, well, I just don't like giving. Does that mean I don't have to give? No, you need to give so it can break that greed off of you and you can learn to give generously. (laughs) Say, but I don't like giving. Well, the more you give, the easier it gets. And the more joyful it becomes. It's just like working out. I didn't like going and doing squats the first time. And the next day, I was super sore. But after six months of doing it, it actually feels pretty good. I enjoy it now. It's the same way that generosity works as well. Pray that there would be a radically generous church. Number six, pray that the church would fulfill the Great Commission. The last thing Jesus says was, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That's fulfilling the Great Commission. And pray that the church would actually reach the lost, that they would care for the lost, that we wouldn't just be a museum for saints, but rather would be a battleship that advances the kingdom of God here in Southeast Texas and beyond. That we would reach the lost, that the seat next to you would be filled with someone that you know and love who have met Jesus and their life has been changed because of your own intentionality and investment into their salvation. That we would fulfill the Great Commission. But the Great Commission actually has two parts. The first part is that we would make disciples. And we're really good at the making disciples part, right? Pray that the church would reach the lost and make disciples. But there's a second part that is equally important, is that we would not only make disciples, but that we would mature disciples as well. That we wouldn't just care for evangelism, but we would also focus on discipleship. He says, to teach them to observe all that he has commanded of you. And so there is the making disciples part, But there's also the maturing disciples part. How do we mature disciples? Pray for your small groups. Pray for your serve team. Pray for next steps to be filled and overflowing every single week. Pray that connect cards would be filled out on a Sunday morning. Pray that people would go online and that they would uh, get connected into the connect page. Pray that we would have systems and operations to where we can actually begin to invest, we can begin to develop, and we can be deploying disciples all across Southeast Texas. That this would not be a church where people show up to be entertained, but this would be a church where people show up, meet Jesus, they are developed, and they're sent back out to be the missionaries that Jesus called them to do. That we would be a church that fulfills the Great Commission. Pray that over your church. I give you a challenge every year. Everyone gets one. 95% of Christians will never get the opportunity to lead one person to Jesus in their lifetime. But Redemption Church is not a statistic. We are a movement, and everyone gets one. This Sunday is Baptism Sunday, and we have 20 people signed up to get baptized this year, which will put us at 100 baptisms for 2022 altogether. 100 <laughs> baptisms in a year. Let's go. Come on. That we would be a church that fulfills the Great Commission. The next thing is that we would be a church that, that prays for the leadership. Here's what 1 Thessalonians says. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord, and they admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love because of the work. Be at peace amongst yourselves. Do you pray for the leadership of your church? 
Do you pray for the, for the leaders, everyone in our, our leadership development, from me and Ashley to, to Ethan and Bree to Trevor and Kayla to JC, the rest of our staff and team, Felicia and, and Meredith, lift these people up so that way we can lead and we can, we, we can serve and we can do so with God's clarity around what we do. I, I love one of my favorite verses comes from 2 King. 2 Kings chapter 1, when Solomon is praying and, and, and God comes to him after a sacrifice and says, he says, what do you want? And here's what Solomon says. He says, Lord, give me wisdom. But what the next thing he says is this. He says, so that way I can lead these great people of yours. I want you to know that the church is great. People may bash the church, criticize the church, complain about the church, but Jesus thinks the church is amazing. And the leaders here, they love you so incredibly much. They need, they need wisdom that comes from the Lord. And that, that's fueled by your prayers. As you are praying to the Lord on their behalf, God, grant these leaders wisdom so they can lead these great people of yours. What a privilege it is to be able to, to serve the church. Now, that, that the wisdom that we need is not in our own strength. It's not in our own wisdom. It's not in our own power. It's not in our own good ideas. I tried to lead the church out of my own ability, and it did not work. We need God's favor upon us as a church, and that's what happens when people pray for their leaders. Take time and pray. Pray for the kids team. Pray for the serve team. Pray for the welcome team. Pray for the worship team. Pray for the production team. Pray for the leaders who are over these departments Pray for the leadership in your church. And I, begin, I believe it will begin to change your heart and begin to change theirs. The, second th the next thing is this. Pray for the people in your church who are suffering. Galatians 6.2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know that every single week there's a person in our church who is hurting or suffering. Every single week. In your small group, there's a person who is hurting and they are suffering. Every single week there's people who are walking through these doors and it took every ounce of energy they had just to be able to get out of bed that morning. You never know the fight that somebody else is facing. You never know the battle that somebody else is going through. And so the, the command here is this. To fulfill the law of Christ, what do we do? We bear the burdens of people next to us. This is why a local church is so important. The loneliness epidemic that people are walking through. The, the, the pain that people are going through. A good church makes the good times twice as good and the bad times half as bad. When you have that church that bears each other's burdens, so that way when you're going through hell, you don't go through it alone. And when you're walking through difficult times, there's somebody who is going to be able to encourage you to make your way through it. A good church makes the good times twice as good. We rejoice with those who rejoice, but at the same time, it makes the bad times half as bad because we mourn and we suffer with those who suffer. Pray that we would bear burdens. Number nine, pray against demonic attacks against the church, Matthew 16, 8. And I tell you this, that you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Why does Jesus say the gates of hell shall not prevail? Because sometimes they, they feel like they're pre prevailing, amen? They look like they're prevailing. They're going to try to prevail. They're going to attack you. Satan hates it whenever you take new territory and new ground for him. So before you were a Christian, before you were a praying believer, God, Satan didn't have a whole lot against you because you are not a threat, but the moment that you picked up the armor of God and the moment you began praying and the moment you began declaring and the moment you began interceding for your church, all of a sudden, as my Nana says, new levels, new devils, baby. And so the more ground you take, the more attack you're going to face. The more, the more testimonies you get, the more resistance you're going to feel. The more the church continues to grow, the greater the opposition is going to be. But that doesn't mean that God's not in it. It just means that God is working even in the midst of it. And so you continue praying, you continue doing warfare, you continue to intercede, and then you'll begin to see breakthrough happen in your church. There will be demonic attacks that come against the church as it begins to take ground for the kingdom of God. But we do do not have to be afraid. We do not have to retreat. All we need to do is to resist the devil and he will flee from you that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. I don't believe the hype that the church is dying. I don't believe the hype that the church is going out of style. I don't believe the hype that Christianity is on its way out the door. No, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail. That is a promise. That is a guarantee. And that is what Jesus is going to do. And so join Jesus in that declaration against demonic attacks against the local church.
And then lastly, what we see is this, pray that the church would be a praying church. Mark 11, 17, Jesus says this, when, he, when he's speaking about the church, here's what he says. He was teaching them and he says is this, is it not written that my house shall be called, wait, whose house was David going to? The house of the Lord. And then here in Mark 11, Jesus says, my house, who is Jesus? Jesus is the Lord. And so David was going up to the old covenant version of the church. And in the new covenant, Jesus changes things up. And and, and here's what he, he, he says. He says, my house shall be called a house of what? A house of prayer. Why is it important that the church prays? Because that was Jesus' vision for the church in the first place. That the church would be a church that prays. That my house... It's Jesus' house. This is Jesus, this is Jesus' church. This is Jesus' vision. The church is Jesus' idea. Jesus invented the church. Jesus made the church. Jesus loves the church. Jesus says, the church is my house. That my house shall be what? It's a house of prayer. So why do we pray as a church? Well, because we are actually just fulfilling Jesus' vision for the church that we would be a place of prayer, that we would be a place that prays. And so for us at Redemption, First Wednesday is a priority for us. That's why we say if you can only make it to one service, you make it the first Wednesday prayer meeting because we are a church that prays. Why? Because the church is only limited by the size of its prayers.